Good morning and hi everyone. Welcome to our Executive Insights webinar hosted by MediaCorp. Today we're going to be talking about new Web3 technologies that are innovating the media and advertising space. Specifically, we're going to focus on how to build new brand digital experiences with NFTs. As a quick introduction, my name is Mark Chong and I'm a partnership manager here at MediaCorp. And it's a passion of mine to explore all things Web3 and see what technologies are going to change the way brands advertise and how audiences consume content. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce my two co-speakers here today. They're experts in the space. We have Zach Burks, the CEO and founder of Mintable, and Dr. Loretta Chen, founder of Smoker Studios. Great to have you here, guys. So let's get things kickstarted with a little bit of interaction with a quick poll. So the question is, has your brand embarked on NFTs in your marketing strategy? And you should see a little pop up here that says yes, no, or not sure how to start. Uh, feel free to click the one that's most relevant. Yeah, we see a couple of results coming in now. We have 50% saying no, 37% saying they're not sure how to start, and about 13% saying yes. So quite a few of you must have uh, had a couple of ideas already underway. So for those who might be a little bit new or unfamiliar to the space, I think it might be useful just to go over a little bit of definitions, some NFT 101. So for those who may not know, NFTs stand for non-fungible token. Now, NFTs are tokens that we can actually use to represent ownership of unique items. Now, it's a little bit technical, but essentially what an NFT is, it's a cryptographic asset on a blockchain. And what that means is that it has unique identification codes and metadata that distinguish one NFT from each other. Now, the really interesting thing about NFTs is that they can only have one official owner at a time. Now, this owner can be a company or it can be an individual. One of the good things about NFTs that we're seeing so much adoption in the industry is because we can actually see who issued the NFT and who owned the NFT and who currently owns the NFT. So what that means is that if you see a graphic that represents an NFT, simply screenshotting or copy and pasting that NFT doesn't make it yours. Um, it's similar to how I would say copyright works. The original owner of that NFT still is recorded on the real version of that. And you just kind of taking a grasp of that doesn't mean that it's yours. So NFTs prove ownership uniquely. Now, that's a little bit confusing. I think one of the ways that I like to explain it is a real world example that Starbucks is actually doing with their Starbucks Odyssey program. And this is a really great way of how a big brand like Starbucks is bringing Web2 and Web3 together and bridging the gap in a way that people can understand. So if we look at the graphic to the right here, how Starbucks Odyssey works is it looks to build on the existing loyalty program and the perks that you would get from going to Starbucks multiple times. Now, as you move throughout the journey, you can see there's a journey section at the top there. And what a journey is, it's almost like a quest or challenge that Starbucks issues to the consumer. Now, these can be things like buying a new product. Let's say it's a new version of a Frappuccino or a new ice blended drink that you really like. Um, it may even be buying a drink during a holiday season like Christmas where they have special cups. Now, once you complete that journey, you're actually issued a NFT called a journey stamp. You've essentially earned that NFT. Now, these journey stamps can then be traded because you are a unique owner of it. It's NFT, which means it's tied to you. You can trade it with other consumers who may want these stamps. Or if you don't complete the journeys, you don't complete the quests, you can go straight to the marketplace and buy them from someone else. Now, if you have a collection of these journey stamps or a type that is sort of on promotion, you can then redeem these stamps at a collector store for exclusive perks and privileges. This can be discounts off your next purchase. These can be a free drink. Um, you know, works very similar to a loyalty or a stamp card. So NFTs can be implemented into things that consumers are very familiar with, but because it's secure, it's safe and more efficient, this is how we can see that we can bridge the gap between Web2 
and Web3. Now, I wanted to sort of show a couple of key facts that why is Media Corp so passionate about the NFT space and why do we bring partners like Zach and Loretta in to work with us and consult with us on multiple projects? And the reason is, is because we see the NFT market cap growing. Currently, right now, we're just about $6 billion in the NFT market. But that doesn't mean that that's the limitation. The actual market value, which means all the NFT value within the market, is already about $40 billion and it's continuing to rise. In 2022, we saw our highest sales volume of NFTs at about $25 billion, and we're still seeing an upward trend. The difference is how NFTs are actually being used. One of the really interesting statistics that we managed to pull is that Southeast Asia is actually one of the top regions for NFT adoption. Asian NFT adoption rates are the highest in the world. And these rates, especially with our neighbors in the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, UAE, and Vietnam, is at 30%. That means 30% of the digital population owns some sort of NFT. And we forecast this to rise to 41% in 2024. Now, you might think to yourself that the perception of NFTs in media is these sort of pieces of artwork that balloon to really crazy prices. But that's actually not the real case. If we look at NFTs, 43% of these are collectibles which means that they're valued because they're something that people want to collect in order to redeem something further down the line. Only 11% of NFTs are actually pieces of art that are minted as artworks. 4.2% of them are NFTs that are linked to the metaverse. And almost 40% of these NFTs that we see in the market today are utility NFTs, which means they have some commercial value or they're used in commercial infrastructure applications such as trading commodities, securing gold, and other assets. So when we look more at an advertiser's lens, we need to kind of figure out how are brands leveraging NFTs today? How are they driving mass adoption of a new technology and at the same time providing exclusive experiences? So as I mentioned previously, NFTs may be digital, but they can represent real-world items, things like real estate, physical artwork, or even luxury goods like handbags. Now, what makes NFTs so useful for brands is that the buying, selling, and trading is now much more secure and efficient. When you have an NFT marketplace, like an e-commerce marketplace, the brands can verify that the item that's being produced came directly from the manufacturer, and the person who owns it next is recorded through the unique identification codes in the metadata of an NFT. And we're seeing so many different applications because now this NFT technology can be scaled to things that we're already used to. If I deserve an exclusive or personalized offer from a brand because I'm loyal to it, then now we can give them a token that secures it towards them and it can't be abused or copied and pasted to someone else. The same works for promotional coupons. Let's say you have an event of a select few and you only want them to get a certain privilege. That is what promotional coupons can do with NFTs. Same with event ticketing, rather than going online and buying a ticket to every single show, if you're a loyal member, you have the NFT on your phone, all you need to do is flash the NFT before you go into the gates. As we saw with Starbucks Odyssey, loyalty programs and memberships are already kind of one of the biggest use cases brands are using right now, but they can also be a vehicle for charity fundraising. So there is a really fantastic angle where, um, let's say, cancer patients are suffering and they're going through art therapy. We can digitize the art that they're creating in those therapies and take them online and actually get people to auction them off. So a great way to raise awareness of a, of a group that may be going through a difficult time and get the public involved in fundraising activities. Now, digital certification is really kind of the bread and butter of what NFTs are, but we're seeing this across education with degrees, making sure that they're authentic by NFTing them. This can be commercial licenses, driving licenses. And we have some people that are even using these again um, to for more commercial applications, such as trading, shipping, all these great things. So a digital certificate or a seat is a really great way to think of an NFT and how they can be used for a bunch of different ways for brands. Which brings me to the most exciting news that I really wanted to kind of showcase here is that we believe in the space. Um, we think that there are experts out there such as Zach, such as Loretta, who not only can teach us more about how NFTs can be used for brands and advertisers, but how blockchain-oriented solutions in general can be applied to our everyday transactions. 
So I'm really proud to announce that MediaCorp admins will have officially signed a agreement to help actually brace entity solutions, kind of reinvigorate in the advertising space with new and innovative solutions, and at the same time, change the way that consumers can engage with brands. So of course it wouldn't be much if, if MediaCorp didn't have a taste of its own medicine. So we already have experimented within the space with our Lunar New Year Happy Bunny NFT campaign. And it was really kind of our first foray into the NFT space with Mintable helping us along the way. But what it looked like is we had MediaCorp artists create unique uh, Lunar New Year bunnies. And we created those artworks into NFTs and then gave them out to 200 people um, during a trade event. Now, the reason we partnered with Mintable is because the process of claiming these NFTs is super simple. As you can see on the top right hand side, all you need is a phone to scan a QR code, your wallet is automatically created, and your NFT is then collected by you, and you become that unique owner. Because of that ease, 85% of people who actually scanned, who actually went to the event, scanned the QR code, redeemed that NFT. And now they are exclusive members who get invites to things such as MediaCorp partner events, perks, backstage passes, and celebrity meet and greet. So we've already experimented in the space and we're happy to be experts in an agency for brands to come to so we can create unique campaigns for you as well. Awesome, so with that being said, um, I'd like to pass it off to Zach Burks who's gonna dive into NFTs and how they can help brands in a little bit more detail. Zach, take it away. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Zach Burks. I'm the CEO and founder of Mintable. Uh, I'll give you a really quick background on myself so you can understand maybe why I'm here, why I'm talking. Uh, I've always been a nerd and uh, I ended up finding Bitcoin very early on. And in around 2012 was when I got into crypto for the first time. And around 2015 is when I became a full-time smart contract developer. Since then, I have been working in the blockchain space, developing code, uh, building uh, innovation and solutions for things that are brand new within the space. And this goes for NFTs. In 2017, when NFTs were created, before the ERC-721 standard was invented, I was working on the spec for it and designing a system to track sapphires at the time. Uh, and ultimately, since then, I have created the royalty standard, the official royalty standard for NFTs, ERC-2981 which is the global standard of how you manage royalties for NFTs. I have created the first DAO that runs completely off of NFTs. We have proprietary technology that I've created called gasless minting, which I'll talk about later. Um, and the list goes on and on. So I'm one of the most experienced NFT developers in the world. Um, and Mintable is one of the largest NFT marketplaces. Now, today we're gonna to be talking about Mintology, which is our B2B arm of Mintable. Mintology, uh, is essentially, let's see, I'm trying to move there. There we go. Mintology is essentially the B2B arm where we work with enterprises, where we take the data, the, the, the terabytes of data that we've got from our consumer marketplace, and we take the proprietary technology that we have of the gasless minting, and we go out to extremely large brands, um, and we say, look, we can help you with your NFT strategy. Whether you are a multi-billion dollar corporation or you're a bubble tea shop, on the corner, there's ways that you can utilize NFTs to expand your business from engagement all the way up to increase in revenue. So one of the things that we have is the white glove enterprise solution that we do um, with some of our clients and coming soon is a self-serve platform, very similar to all the other self-serve business platforms that you would use that you're familiar with as a business owner, where you're gonna be able to go in and manage your own NFT strategy. The current challenge that a lot of our clients face now when they come to us is they say, Zed, we want to get into NFTs, but we're having a problem because we don't know, you know how we can compete with our competition. How can we get to a one-time user and get them to re-engage with our brand to re-drive revenue from that one-time person or the accessibility of being able to go and seek their audience to engage with them instead of just walk into their store, get a cup of tea and then walk out and never come back, right? So brands struggle with these things and NFTs allow for the ability for you to fix all three of these actually. Um, how does that happen? 
Well, essentially, NFTs can reach a new audience or can re-engage a similar audience or the same audience. With this key aspect of re-engagement, you're able to drive new revenue streams. You're able to drive different levels of engagement. You're able to, as you know, Mark talked about, he saw 85% redemption rate of the guests that came in. 85% redemption rate is a huge figure. If you think about any loyalty program, having 85% of your customer demographic come in and engage with that program is a massive success, right? Now, if you can monetize that revenue, if you can, that, that the loyalty program or that engagement, if you can monetize that and to create a new revenue stream as a business, you're now looking at, you know, a whole new line item on your balance sheet or on your profit and loss statement that shows we made X amount of money this year just from the NFTs alone. And later I'll talk about Nike, but Nike made over $200 million from their NFTs within one year, right? So that is a brand new line item on their balance sheet that they're able to say, look at how much revenue we were able to bring in. They're also able to stand out because of what brands do. The other brands in the sector follow them or they say, oh, we've got to compete with them. We've got to one up them. You know, when Coca-Cola came out with the NFT, Pepsi came out with NFTs. When Budweiser came out with the NFT, you sure bet there was other beer companies that came out with NFTs, right? Um, or engaged with NFTs in some way, right? The other aspect that is really important too is when you talk about utility of NFTs, there's the counterfeit problem, right? And so if you're a brand like Prada, Dolce & Gabbana, or any of these high-end luxury brands, you always have counterfeits and counterfeits are a problem across the world. Um, NFTs allow for you to sell a item with a certificate that can prove the authenticity of that item. And as Mark was talking about, when you go into a marketplace and you're looking at an NFT, there's the data associated with it that's on the blockchain that allows for the consumer to know with 100% fact that this is a genuine Dolce & Gabbana NFT. This is a genuine Prada NFT. This is a genuine Rolex, Ferrari, whatever high-end luxury brand it may be. Or it could just be, this is a genuine Boba Tea NFT from you know the shop down on the corner. This is something that allows you to be able to reach an audience, connect with the audience, build a community where you might not have had a community um, and then ultimately increase the revenue that's coming into your business if you choose to do so. You don't always have to increase revenue. And in some situations, the engagement itself will reflect on the revenue and not so much from the NFT itself, but the engagement of that NFT. This quote, I think, is a brilliant quote to talk about because when you allow for NFTs to come into your brand and into your business model, you're actually taking your, your consumers the, the buyers and you're turning them into co-creators, ambassadors, people that believe more so in your brand and your business than they did previously. And this is very, very powerful. If I'm walking into the, the bubble tea shop on the corner and I've gotten an NFT, but that NFT comes with a community aspect to it. Now I'm constantly thinking about this shop on the corner opposed to all the other bubble tea shops around Singapore. I'm thinking about one particular one because there's this community element to it. And as humans, naturally, we want to belong into a community, right? If you go back to the caveman era, we were always lumped together in small groups of our communities. And that's the power behind NFTs is the ability to make these community connections and the ability for your brand to then monetize on top of those communal connections that are being created. So the proper NFT strategy is key here because it allows for you to do exactly what I just said, build a community, but then also create value. And those two elements, if you are a business owner, which I'm assuming most of you are, you know automatically the wheels are probably turning right now in your head thinking, okay, you're right. If I can build a community and I can create value, that's, that's a gold mine. not just in terms of money, but in terms of what it means for your brand, for your business, for your users that allows them to go the next step uh, in terms of the interactions between you and them. And that's very, very helpful. Um, that's also very, very beneficial for your balance sheet. So let's talk about some of the brands and how they're using. It. So 
Starbucks, we've already talked about with Mark. And Starbucks is a really awesome model because of what they're doing with the membership and the way that they're doing their quests or journeys, as they call them. Um, and we'll talk about them. Nike, though, has gone through the community aspect with this co-creation platform. And that is super powerful because no longer are you just buying shoes, but instead you have this ability to take part in the process of those shoes. So it's not just saying, oh, I have these, you know, pair of Nikes that are amazingly hot right now, or, you know, they're the newest fad, but you have a pair that you have created a variation of yourself. And then you're able to, to say that these are mine. These are unique to me. And I created these. Not only are they the hottest fad right now, and, you know, I can buy them as an investment, but there's something that I have personalized myself. And personalization allows for that emotional connection, which is really powerful. And so when we go back to the community, the connecting and the aspects that you want for engagement, NFTs really do drive through the roof the ability for your users to be able to connect. Starbucks has done something, which is the simple, you know, you get the simple card that says every coffee you get, you get a stamp, right? On your 10th coffee, you get a free coffee, right? Um, they've taken that. And they've really gone to the next level with NFTs. And that's one of the abilities of NFTs, which is the membership and the loyalty program aspect. We at Intology are very, very keen on this. We have a lot of clients that use membership and loyalty NFTs. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why. And I'll talk on that a little bit later. Um, but essentially, almost any business can create a membership or loyalty program using NFTs. It's very little friction. It's very little overhead, and there is a massive upside. If you're seeing 85% engagement like what MediaCorp saw, and your overhead is very little, and your upside of that 85% means increased revenue, you know, repeat business, repeat visits, or uh, essentially a community being built where there wasn't a community, then it's a no-brainer. Why would you not want to do it? Dulce and Gabbana did a little bit different. Dolce & Gabbana dropped a limited edition collectible, right? And so this is a direct revenue line, right? This is a direct, hey, this is limited edition. There's only going to be X amount of them. We're going to sell them. And then they're going to realize the profits from selling those items, right? Uh, with Dolce & Gabbana, you know, it was a virtual and a physical NFT because obviously Dolce & Gabbana makes physical, you know, you know retail products. Uh, but they wanted to make it virtual in the same element because it's an NFT. This is a really unique way for you to be able to reach into the internet space and also into the retail space and combine the two. And then there was a community created out of that uh, you know, process. So ultimately, if you think about it, Dulce and Gabbana achieved something phenomenal. They took a product, they sold the product, and then the people that bought that product came back and continually are re-engaging with them and re-engaging with their community about something that they went into a store and bought. How often do you get to see that in today's day? If you remove NFTs from the equation, how many times have you walked into a store, bought something, and then gone and engaged with the community around people that bought this similar item? Very, very few real world examples are you ever going to see that. But NFTs allow that. And that's why brands are latching onto NFTs at an extremely fast pace is because they see the value here. So I'll talk a little bit about how our partners or some of our partners are using NFTs outside of MediaCorp. So we have MasterCard. MasterCard is one of the largest companies uh, that is diving into NFTs, you know, multi-billion dollar international company. And they've used NFTs across the board in multiple ranges through Mintology. But I'll give you an example, which I think is really interesting that I wanted to point out for today's presentation, which is this scavenger hunt NFT. So I'm sure a lot of you here have been to corporate events, uh, corporate conferences, especially like a MasterCard conference. On day three, it's kind of a drag, right? After day three, you've seen all the booths, you've talked to all the people, you're going there, you're going through the motions. MasterCard knows this, MasterCard realizes this. They said, Zach, how can we solve this problem? How can we make more engagement when we go to these conferences? How can we get the people at these conferences to engage on a higher level and to participate more or to see all the way through to day three? Um, what we came up with was the scavenger hunt. And the scavenger hunt is a really cool way to improve the participation 
of the users because as they would go through the conference, they had to find the NFT that was hidden somewhere in the conference. And if they collected all the NFTs, then they got a special final NFT that gave them some sort of perk. So if you just went to the conference alone for the only reason to get that perk, you would scavenge around the entire uh, conference, get all the NFTs together, and then you got this you know, final NFT that came with an awesome perk. Hello Vacay is a travel platform. They're doing a membership program, and you can see down in the bottom, uh, the bottom of my presentation here is they get there's a limited edition pilot passport, and this pilot passport NFT allows for a range of perks on the travel side. They go all the way up to eighty percent off. So whether it's a hotel room or a flight, um, or whether it's extremely uh, lucrative rates at a luxurious hotel that you normally would never find anywhere. You're able to get that only if you have that NFT. So people have rushed to go get these NFTs because they know that within the next year, if they travel, they're able to get 20, 30, 50, 80% off what they're trying to do all through the NFTs. And what does this do from a competitor standpoint, though? If I wanted to go and I have this passport and I'm going to go on a trip, do I go to Expedia or do I go to Hello Vacay's platform? because I can get 80% off. So you can see how you can differentiate yourself from the competitors by utilizing NFTs and having a utility around those NFTs. And this is really, really important because not only does that increase your revenue, but that is repeat business. And then you have a community aspect that you can touch on and that completes the whole loop, right? So it's a flywheel of constant engagement, constant revenue, constant streams coming into your business that you never had before all because of NFTs. But there's a lot of things you need to consider before you dive right into NFTs. And this is kind of what we do is we sit down with brands and we say, okay, first off, the number one most important thing is alignment with your brand. Nike, Starbucks, Dolce & Gabbana, the first thing they did was said, how do we align the NFT strategy with our brand? I'll give you an example of where NFTs will not work at all. You're a fishing company, you go off the coast, you fish, you go to a market, you sell those fish. You don't have a brand. You don't have consumers. You don't need NFTs, not gonna work. Every other business where you do have a brand and you do have consumers, NFTs can work. And all you need to do is make sure that your NFTs align with the brand image that you're trying to portray. Then you go into the legalities. This is kind of a, no one likes legalities, but it's a, you know, it's something you have to deal with, right? First off, you gotta make sure that it's on a security. It's not an investment vehicle. Then you got to think about from the users end. What are you giving the users? Do you want the users to have complete control of the NFT or do you want them to have no control of the NFT? We have a range from all of our clients. Some clients say we want to be able to take the NFT back at any time. We want to have complete control over the copyrights. We don't want to give the user anything. Some the complete opposite. They say we don't want any access to the NFT. We want to give them complete freedom to reuse this, relicense this, a worldwide exclusive license. Right? And that's up to you. You get to pick that. And it goes based off of whatever strategy that you and your company are trying to do. Then you got to consider the target audience and how you're going to go to market and reach that audience. Right. So for Hello Vacay, for example, or MasterCard, for example, they had two different strategies of how they reached the audience. For MasterCard, it was at the conference. So the very first thing you did when you went to the conference was you got your very first NFT. You got your wallet, you got onboarded with the very first NFT, and that was before you even registered for the actual conference. So you register for NFT, and then you register for the conference. And that ensured that every single participant of the conference got at least one NFT and was aware of the NFT strategy that's going on. Then you move into the technical requirements. When you work with someone like Mintable or Mintology, you don't gotta worry too much about that. We're the experts in the field here. We'll tell you exactly what needs to happen from your end, from our end, or if there's something custom, how we can do it and achieve this, right? But you do also need to understand from a high level what your capabilities are with NFTs. A lot of people don't realize, uh, as Mark said, you know, degrees and certificates, the utility of an NFT, it doesn't need to be for retail. There are banks that are using NFTs and they're using it internally. And you might think, why would a bank use an NFT internally? I'm going to leave that question for you to think about. Because if you think about it, you'll come up with the answer, but a internal NFT that is not exposed to the world by a bank, what could they be using it for? These technical requirements 
are important for you to understand because it opens your mind to realizing that you can stand out from your competitors by doing something very novel and unique. Finally, the last and most important for any you know, campaign is your ROI. How much are you getting back on what you've spent and how are you measuring these metrics, right? What are your KPIs? What is the ROI you're trying to achieve? And then you can go ahead and correlate those two together and say, okay, how much success did we see? In the case of Media Corp, right, they had their KPIs and their ROI that they wanted to achieve, and then they got 85% rates, right? So these are things you have to consider before you start. And then once you start, that's when the fun begins. Thanks much, Zach. Um, love the energy. It got me excited again, which is always nice. Um, we've just got a lot of questions coming in the chat, so we'll just pick one for now, and then we're going to move speedily through so we can give some, some space for Loretta. Um, one of the questions that we have here, which I think is pretty good, is now we've talked about all the different ways entities uh, and brands can use entities for their own marketing campaigns. Now, what are some of the dangerous or unsuccessful campaigns that you've seen in the past? What has not worked? What has not worked? Um, what has not worked is money grabs. So when a brand comes in and they just try to drop NFTs to get as much money as possible and then completely dump it. Uh, when I say dump it, I mean dump the project. They just, they, they never follow up. They create this community and then there is no community, right? What essentially it was is they were selling a product. They said, thank you for your money. See you later. That doesn't work. It always comes back to bite the brand. Um, and it hurts the brand. So whenever you're going to be utilizing NFTs, make sure that there's a utility behind it and make sure you follow through with your promise, right? And Lorietta is going to talk about how you can do some of these follow throughs through like the metaverse, right? Um, and when you do that, you can't just abandon the idea. Just like if you're going to do, you know, a new branding campaign, you can't abandon it halfway through the campaign. So that's, that's a very important uh, element is that don't, don't be a cash grab. And don't look at it as a cash grab, uh, but look at it as a new utility and a new aspect of the business. Yeah, thanks for that, Zach. It seems that having a, a NFT marketing strategy that's long-term is really the best way to approach this. It's not really just sort of a one-time activation. If you are going to experiment, it does need to be quite thorough. So thanks for that. Um, we can move on and um, we can get to Loretta in a little bit as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just really quickly go through a little bit of examples. Um, so we've talked about this, right? You're a food and beverage company. You want to do a membership program. You're that bubble tea shop on the corner. You're lagging customer engagement. There's another shop across the street. How do you get people to engage with you, right? Well, you create this NFT loyalty program. You give them perks, experience, discounts. Maybe one Saturday night a month, you shut down or you open up a little bit earlier. You stay open late and you offer an event that goes on only for the NFT holders, your competitor across the street who closes, they're closed, but yet you're open and you've got your customers in your business when normally you would not have them there. And this is how you can stand out, right? This increases the revenue, this increases your loyalty engagement, and this increases that brand awareness. On the other side, if you look at the apparel company, right? Maybe you're starting out a fashion company, you've got a brand that you want to expand, but you don't have just the scale of your brand awareness. So you create a limited edition figural, right? Now, figural is a, it's a very weird term, but it's a physical and a digital collectible, which is where you have a clothing item like maybe this shirt that comes with the NFT as well. This allows for a value creation ad for the consumer end, increase in revenue. And then of course, the brand awareness goes up because you're doing something unique. Mintology allows for all of this to happen through our proprietary technology called gasless minting. So this is a frictionless, easy experience that allows for you to mint an NFT on Ethereum with zero fees. And when I say zero fees, I mean zero fees. We are the only place on the entire internet that allows for you to create an NFT on mainnet Ethereum with no fees to create that NFT. They're not deferred. They're not being paid by for us. It's not on a layer two. It is on mainnet Ethereum and we have completely removed the cost to create that NFT. And if you ask me how I did it, I will not tell you it's secret sauce. That's our secret sauce, but it allows for us to offer all these really, really advantageous ways to utilize NFTs. And then when you mix that in with our custodial wallet that we provide, a user can come in, scan a QR code while they're in line. And then within minutes, they're able to have an NFT, have a wallet, 
They've never used crypto before. They've never had to go to an exchange or do anything like that. And they're onboarded into NFTs and crypto while they're in line at your shop. And that was the whole goal behind Mintology. And I see Laureate is already moving on. So with that, I will say uh, thank you for the time today. Thanks, Zach. Um, really appreciate all that insight into NFTs. Now we're going to have Loretta really explain how we can bridge that gap from NFTs to the metaverse and see some really interesting case studies and projects that she's worked on in the past couple months. Take it away, Loretta. Hi there, everybody. Hi, I, and uh, thanks for that, Zach. No, and actually, that wasn't me taking over. <laughs> that was actually just the screen. Okay, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm um, Loretta, founder and uh, CEO of Smoba Studios, and we are the like there's a bit of a lag when I click the slide. We are Singapore's first and official, the Sandbox Endorsed Metaverse Agency, and we're focused on integrating Web3 uh, digital applications as well as co-creating a diverse ecosystem with a strong academy um, emphasis, as you can tell. So uh, I also want to make sure that I integrate some of your questions in my talk set because I left the, the chat room. It's rife with all these questions. So I'll try and answer your questions as I go along as well. Uh, so... Suffice to say that we largely work with, at the start, especially during, uh, and I'm, you know, now that we're in a bear market, we're still building because we largely work with legacy brands, uh, government agencies. I saw some of you asking about government agencies, so I'll address that question in a while. Um, and this was how we really started our business, really building brand and credibility by working with, you know, some of these really legacy brands that you know of, like Media Corp, for example. And of course, now we move on to taking on other brands, Web3 brands as well. And what is our USP? Fundamentally, we like to say that we humanize the metaverse because fundamentally, even with technologies, even if NFTs, the core is still about brand storytelling. We want to be able to hear what you want and we want to be able to incorporate that in a campaign that you actually want, that your consumers actually uh, care for. So uh, we've also formed really strong partnerships, MediaCorp, for example, uh, we've formed partnerships with banks, uh, with government agencies. So again, I'm going to answer some of your questions that are there. And uh, currently, uh, while we are actually invested in by the Sandbox, we built across different metaverses and we are actually now leaders in the space. And uh, for some of you, uh, this part here may be relevant to some of your questions because some of those questions here uh, came up on, on the metaverse and Web3. So fundamentally, I'm going to skip through these slides uh, very briskly in the essence of time. But fundamentally, I think we didn't come here. We didn't just parachute in here, right? It was a gradual evolution, as you heard Zach say. You know, he's been in the space for a while. But I think fundamentally, there was a lot of distrust in the current uh, financial system that we, we, we have. Right. So fast forward to where we are today with the pandemic, uh, with Meta's change of name. Thank you, Meta. It's led us to greater decentralization. Uh, what's really done is that it's really ramped up the space. So for those of you who are still wondering, okay, what is Web3? What is the metaverse? So a short definition will be this, right? Um, and the days of the Web1 would be where you could go online and you were able to just download information. It was a one-way street. Right. Uh, and that would be what I would call the information economy, where you could go online, but you can't really interact. You just downloaded information. It was very one way. Web 2 is the, the, the era that we're in now, which is the age of interaction. I mean, we're all interacting. You're texting, you are on social media platforms. But fundamentally, and this is key, is that to Zach's point too, that even though you are a content creator, you're Kim Kardashian, you put all your information on the information superhighway on the internet, on your social media platforms, you don't own any of it, right? So Apple can turn around and pull your data. Meta can turn around and pull your data and pull it and pull you off the internet. I remember on the day that Meta changed its name for Facebook to Meta, uh, they actually pulled the account of her lady and her account was Meta, right? And she was like, oh, what? So these are things that can happen, which is why we're now moving towards it is an evolution it is not a one-click switch uh, we are now in what i call the age of identity immersion and interoperability this web3 space where it's about greater decentralization uh, where it's not just about all the information and power residing with big tech but really uh, now that things are on a blockchain you can potentially own all of this information because it is inscribed on an nft and zach has spoken a lot about that so i'm not going to um talk more about that. And so, but what is key about this is that data ownership is returned to the users and hence, you know, you are now part of a community. I mean, there are only two industries that I can think of that literally call users, users. One is the uh, technology uh, industry. We call you users. And the other is 
drugs. I mean, if you put these two together, you can kind of see how we've been addicted or trained to becoming users. But today, we really want you to become a community. It's like you become a shareholder just by holding on to an NFT. So we are democratizing shareholding. Uh, case studies, some of you have asked for case studies. Case studies always grounded and at Smobler, one of the reasons why we're leaders is because we have case studies. I'm not going to uh, uh, go through too much of this again, again in the essence of time, but we actually created the first ever digital wedding. It was a couple that literally really got married and the approach is to say we want to do a real wedding. IRL in real life, but also in the metaverse. So we actually created digital wedding where we organized their in real life wedding, but we had a metaverse experience. So you see them walking down the aisle in a metaverse. And we actually had Sebastian Bourget, who is the COO of the Sandbox. And I thought it'd be really fun to have the COO of the biggest uh, open metaverse uh, officiate their wedding in the metaverse while in real life. Uh, the pastor obviously did uh, the ceremonial uh, uh, oaths and all of that. So that um, wedding actually garnered a lot of attention. And so I, I encourage you to go take a look at that. And on, on the wedding itself, what we did was uh, there was a QR code and all the attendees and the guests could actually scan that QR code. And by having that NFT or proof of attendance protocol, what happens mm -hmm. is that we then guarantee that later on when the couple have a baby bash, uh, like these guests will obviously get first invites to come and, you know, uh, relive the, the happiness and, and uh, joyful days of, of the couple and be, and be part of the family, like literally be part of the community. Uh, some of the other case studies, this is something that we just started on. So we invite all of you to be part of our community. You're going to hear this a lot. You're not just a user or a buyer. You're going to be a community. Uh, this year is going to be the 70th year of the ascent, of the first ascent of uh, Mount Everest. Uh, Sir Edmund Hillary climbed uh, or summited uh, Mount Everest 70 years ago. And so we decided to create an experience for those of us. I don't know about you, but I've never had a chance to climb Mount Everest, even though I've lived in the Himalayas. Uh, but now you are able to experience the thrill and the exhilaration of being in Mount Everest. Right. And part of this, too, is that when you own this NFT, not only do you get uh, the experience, but you also get to really get to know the community better. You understand the Sherpa people uh, and uh, you also get to hear firsthand from the ambassadors themselves. So what we're doing um, with a lot of our, our projects is trying to bring the digital and, and, and the metaverse together. So we have real life ambassadors uh, becoming the face of our campaign. And uh, if you were. Uh, on our metaverse, you could be one of these avatars and you could be meeting up with Wasfia, who is the first Bangladeshi female to have um, summited uh, Mount Everest together with, together with Canton Cool, for example. So you could be metaphorically and metaversely climbing these mountains alongside our ambassadors and learning more about climate change, learning more about sustainability in a more in-depth, immersive way as well. So I think we have a little trailer for you. I'm just going to play it quickly and then pause and take a couple of questions before we move on. So let's do that and let's go. Let's play that again. So this will be launching in May. And for some of you, you may be wondering, okay, is this the only metaverse that Smobile built on? No. Um, like I said, even though Sandbox is our investor, we actually work across different metaverses. However, one of the reasons why we choose to showcase the Sandbox is because it has one of the most developed ecosystems uh, from you know, user-generated content and user-generated tools and content, uh, as well as an open marketplace. They also have tools like the Vox Edit and Game Maker. So it just has a more end-to-end -end, um, ecosystem that I, I just think it's easier as well to share 
um, with all of you in our community. So I'm just going to pause there um, for questions. So uh, Mark, fire away. Yeah, happy to scan the Q&A. I think one of them is, is probably what a lot of people here as advertisers and marketers are thinking. Um, what have you seen as being the most successful strategy for marketing people to metaverse experiences? What channel should they advertise on? Oh, you okay, Media Corp. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right. No, but I, I think uh, uh but jokes aside, I mean, seriously, I think partnerships with you know social media, mass media, uh, uh like broadcasters like uh, uh Media Corp is definitely one way. However, I think one of the most effective strategies is really thinking about the experiences that you cannot create in real life. I know there is a lot of push towards wanting to create digital twins. I'm not against that. I think digital twins have a part to play. I think have a part to play largely in, and we have clients like this right you own a huge logistics warehouse you I think it, it's incumbent upon you to perhaps build a digital twin because you don't need to fly your clients down to XYZ to you know Sembawang just to take a look at your logistics warehouse however if you are a brand your clothing company you are you know a, um, a f and um, a merchant right you don't have to recreate exactly what your um, outfit looks like or exactly what your shop looks like. I think use the metaverse at what it can do best, meaning it can invert the logics of gravity. You can create imaginative spaces. So for example, for example, what we did for literally one of our clients, one group, uh, one group, as you know, is one of the biggest F&B uh, chains in Singapore and they own destination places. So when I first started working with Joseph, he was like, why would I want to recreate you know, my space in the metaverse when I have these beautiful spaces? And my point is, don't recreate it. Make it imaginative. Make it fun. So, for example, while you might have seen the photo earlier that we actually recreated, Alcuff mentioned, we could take artistic liberties with it, right? Because the, the wedding couple wanted disco. And so we're able to build a disco there. And we're able to build also like a Chinese wedding arena there. I mean, these are the things, dreams and fantasies that your community may want or your customers may want, but they're unable to live it in real life because one, is cost prohibitive. Two, um, you know, it's just not allowed. I mean, think of all the, all the legislation and all the <laughs> permits you need to get. Um, and three, it could be a simple thing like a personal preference, right? Like the bride really, really wanted her dog, really wanted her dog there. Not many places would allow her, but guess what? In a metaverse, like you can have, you can bring all your doggy friends and furry friends. So I will say, allow playfulness, allow creativity, because that's how you can also allow a sense of escapism and fun for your customers that some they sometimes won't have in real life. And I think sometimes locking down the heartstrings is where you begin to like open the purse strings. So I think that could be a good strategy to, to think of. Mark? Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I think this leads well into the next question that we have is, it seems like these metaverse experiences can be pretty much anything that you put your mind to it, right? It's really about the message you're trying to send across. Are there any ways or, or sort of metaverse experiences that you've been a part of that looks to do something that does pull a little bit more on the emotional side? Um, do we have any sort of metaverse experiences that maybe try and bring awareness to a CSR initiative or let's say a, a, a charity case, for example? Great question, right? I think this uh, this is a perfect segue to um, things that we started doing. I'm just going to skip through these couple of slides. Basically, the, these slides just tell you like we sold out our, our NFT collection within 30 minutes. But this really brings us to our metaverse for good. You know, it, in the in, a, in in during the the bull market, there were so many hype NFT projects, and one of the things that you know I actually resisted was to take on these clients that only wanted to do hype. Um, and in many ways, it, it has paid off because in a bear market, we're still here, we're still building, we're working with you, MediaCorp, and so many other uh, brands like DBS and Starhub and other um, legacy brands because we really stuck to our metaverse for good initiative. What is that? It's really fundamentally about us sticking to our ideals: inclusion, diversity, equity, access, leadership, love, sustainability. But we really Really put our money where our mouth is, meaning we, we categorically have come out to say we don't want to do violent um, experiences in a metaverse. I truly think that um, they could go to someone else, but I really want to tell brand stories that want to do good. So we have like a family uh, office, for example, that has pledged their lands to us. So if any one of you out there actually want to dip your toes into the metaverse, we have free to use land for you to dip your toes in. Of course, you must pledge to do good. And of course, you you would, we would then, be, uh, but of course, there is a commercial value towards the build, but you can be given free to use land for you to try out 
in the metaverse. So some of the uh, case studies that we've done um, include, uh, let me just, uh, the first one that we did was a food bank. Uh, it was the first nonprofit to come into the metaverse. And what we did was an end-to-end -end, uh, metaverse solution, meaning we designed the NFTs. One of the things that we did was to embed real world utility into the NFT. So for example, the food bank has these um, vending machines uh, where if you lived in a low income neighborhood, you could actually go to the vending machines and get hot food. OK, so what we did was that in the early days to encourage people to understand what utility is, we literally got an artist to create the vending machine. It was very, very cute um, onto an NFT. And we'll approach somebody like MediaCorp and we say, hey, MediaCorp, um, you know, could you support charity and buy this NFT? And if MediaCorp buys this NFT, what we'll do is we'll go around Singapore and skin the vending machine with MediaCorp logo. Now, this does a few things. One, um, it gives awareness to what an NFT utility is, albeit in very simple form. Two, it allows MediaCorp to flex its CSR muscles and say, hey, look, we're supporting so-and-so in Papayo, you know, and, and we're supporting, you know, a food bank all over Singapore. Look at how wonderful we are. But third, it also allows the company to write it off as a marketing expense, especially in the early day. It was so hard to say, how do I dabble in crypto? And today it could still be a challenge for a lot of companies um, and you out there. So these are interesting strategies that we think of. We've also gotten um, SG Enable to, to grant us half a million dollars to build up disability park. Um, we also have a million dollar scholarship that we worked with um, a school, uh, Aventis uh, Graduate School, to provide uh, ASEAN scholars access to MBA programs with uh, metaverse um, certification, etc. So many, many um, things that, that, that we have done. And I'm going to pause there because I know we're almost out of time. So I'm going to pause there, Mark, and, and have you um, perhaps ask me questions or uh, direct traffic and time. Yeah, thanks, Lorda. I think, um, you know, that, that slide gave a good overview of the different projects that you had. Feel free to just kind of go through some of the different ones so people can see the names and, and things that you're associated with. I'll take sure. some of the, the the most sort of popular questions that we have here. Uh, the first one is for you, Loretta. It is talking a little bit more about the demographic and active users on Sandbox and Decentraland right now. Uh, do you have any sort of ballpark local estimates for SG users or maybe even global users, if that's possible? Yeah, uh, and you know, one of the reasons why um, we've also invested a lot of our time in, in the Sandbox uh, is because it literally targets 18 to 45 year olds, right? So most times people think that, oh, Minecraft or Roblox is a metaverse. I mean, in, in the sense, if it's immersive, if, it, if there's playtime and your avatars that are in there, yes, it is technically a, a virtual world, but in, in our strictest definition for it to qualify as a metaverse, there must be real world economic activity in a way that Roblox still isn't, right? Because all the money, whatever daddy and mommy are making, it goes to your Robux, right? And it's a publishing, it's a game publishing company that still makes that money. But when you're on a platform like say um, the Sandbox, what happens is that it is an open metaverse and the, and the creator revenues actually go back to the creators. So to, to your point, Mark, um, a lot of our uh, you, uh, community that is on the sandbox is between that age group. And guess what? That is an age group that also has the highest disposable income. So that's also something to, to really think about as well. Okay, thanks so much for that. I think we've got time for one more question. So I think this one is gonna be posed to Zach. It's a little on, on NFTs. So Zach, um, brands obviously care a lot about conversion for a lot of their campaigns. And whether that's converting straight away or further down the funnel, I want to know a little bit more about how brands can use NFTs or NFT campaigns to actually collect customer data and use that for marketing purposes. Uh, what would be a good strategy to do this? Yeah, one of the best strategies would be giving away free NFTs, right? Free NFTs, um, for example, when you walk into a store or when you're online, uh, simply putting in your email to get this free NFT that could be a coupon, it could be a part of a loyalty membership, whatever it may be you're getting that first bit of data to be able to re-engage that customer. And so one of the use cases that we have is for restaurants is to be able to integrate with their POS system. Um, but for them to get that coupon to then claim with that POS system, they've got to engage with either their SMS, um, they'll get an SMS code or they'll give us their email, right? And when you get that email and that SMS, you're then able to take that data. Now you have that data and then you can then market back to them to engage them later on within the funnel. So okay, fantastic. giving away a free, yeah, free NFTs is the answer to the question. Cool. So free NFTs really help drive that mass adoption and then therefore kind of putting in different boxes or data collection so that you can give them those rewards for claiming those NFTs is the way to go. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, it looks like we're just about running on time here. So I just want to say thank you so much to Zach and Loretta for joining me here today. Always a pleasure talking to you. Always great learning more and getting some of that energy about the different innovative technologies that we can use ourselves. Um, for everyone else that's in the chat here today, do note that we didn't get to everyone's questions, so I do apologize for that. Uh, no worries. What we'll do is we're going to EDM everyone after this with a couple of answers to this. Loretta, Zach, and I will have a go at some of these questions that are posed here. Um, but that being said, of course, we have our details in the chat. So if you're interested in learning more about NFT marketing and solutions, feel free to reach out to me. If you want some in-depth insider knowledge from NFT platforms like Mintology and Mintable, do head to Zach. Uh, and for Loretta Chen, everything Metaverse, uh, please refer to her and she'll be more than happy to uh, answer those questions as well. So uh, again, thank you so much for joining us here today. Hopefully it was an insightful session. And uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch. We'll be more than happy to build some strategies with you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, please connect. Thank you.